members of uh, members of the European Parliament involved in the decision making of the European Union, particularly the law making process within the European Union architecture, was uh, a learning experience for all of you. I understand that finally you didn't have a directive because the council blocked it. Yeah. It's by the way, the usual thing for the past few years, I'm sure you know that the European Union is seriously deteriorating itself for too many years now. So uh, I would like to exchange with you this open dialogue, we call it structured dialogue, uh, some, some thoughts and uh, for the next 20 minutes and then just open the discussion. Uh, open the floor for a conversation so that you can raise your points, your remarks, your uh, your opinions or, or even your dissent vis-a-vis uh, -vis every word that I'm about to say. The first point I would like precisely to, to share with all of you is that yes, the European Union is in its worst crisis ever. It is its worst crisis ever. I mean, it's been said so many times, it's a kind of an inertia, some kind of a, you know, a rhetoric that uh, the European Union has made progress in history precisely throughout a succession of crises. But we have never seen a crisis like this. We have never seen anything like it. Uh, some call it a poly crisis, a multi crisis, multi dimensional crisis. In the outset, they told us it was a financial crisis. But the point is that that financial crisis turned out to be an economic crisis due to the destruction of uh, 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 business and jobs. It turned out to be a social crisis. And with the uh, unrest and the satisfaction, that followed, it turned out to be a political crisis. With the spread of mistrust, mutual mistrust, and misunderstandings all over the place, it turned out to be a crisis of leadership. And in the end, it turned out to be an identity crisis, an existential crisis, as John Claude Juncker put it just uh, a week ago. Uh, in the occasion of what we call the debate on the State of the Union, it was held in the plenary session in Strasbourg just some weeks ago. Yes, it's an existential crisis, and the European Union is challenged in its very raison d'etre, in its very reason for being the European Union. So it's, it's kind of a subversion. Some years ago, in 2011, when this crisis apparently was reaching to its peak. I published an essay, a book, by the title El Suicidio de Europa, which means Europe in a suicidal mood. In a suicidal mood. Europe committing, about to commit suicide. And I was uh, scorned. I mean, ah, that's too dramatic. That's, that's an overstatement. No, it wasn't. Now the idea of Europe in a self-destruction path is, is, is very much spread. And there are so many pundits and commentators and choreographers who are writing about the self destruction of the European Union that we are just contemplating. Some of us are combating this process. And in my personal combat, I have been involved in the European Parliament heavily in the area of fundamental rights, liberties, justice, and home affairs. I have been chair of the Liberal Committee, which is the committee in charge of liberties. Justice and Home Affairs for five years, and being heavily involved in this lawmaking process, precisely in that field of action, which happens to be my view of the essence, absolutely fundamental. Why I say so? I'm sure you know that when the Lisbon Treaty entered into force, was effective December 2009, the, uh, the idea was that. Uh, if there was an institution that was improved in its position vis-a-vis -vis all the rest was precisely the European Parliament. The European Parliament had been for some years, decades, uh, 
an assembly in which you could argue about almost everything about the sky. At a certain point in time, uh, the UK Parliament has turned out to be truly a parliament. It's, it's, it's about political pluralism, it's the political groups, but it's also about lawmaking. Lawmaking. We're not anymore arguing about conflicts in the world, about the situation of human rights in Yemen, which is beyond our reach. There's nothing we can do to improve the situation of human rights in Yemen. Can we? No, we can't. But we can make laws. We can actively get involved in the lawmaking process of the European Union, and particularly in the area of human rights and security, which was, for years, the realm of intergovernmental cooperation. That's what they called before the entry into force of this treaty, the third pillar. The third pillar, you remember? The instrument was a framework decision, which was only binding for those countries willing to incorporate into the legal systems, into the domestic legal systems, the content of the so-called framework decision. But when this new treaty entered into force, finally, the area of really death and security turned out to be the jurisdiction of the European Union and the competence of the European Parliament as a lawmaker. Then we started to make laws on fundamental rights. We started to make laws on judicial cooperation against transporter, serious crime. We started to make laws on the criminal law field. We turned out to be a criminal lawmaker with the European Parliament, fighting against global crime, and transnational serious crime. And that is precisely the subject I was uh, uh, invited to, to discuss with you this afternoon. So I, I am intending to exchange some views on the on the precise subject, which is, I'm sure you have noticed by now, precisely the subject that I'm trying to encompass. I'm trying to frame within this uh, this, uh, this mental uh, comprehension of uh, what the area of liberty, justice, and security means after the Lisbon Treaty entered into force, which is the case. We have been making laws in the criminal law field, which are binding for the member states. Sometimes there are regulations when they implement fundamental rights. That was the case of data retention. That was the case of data protection. Data protection package, most important. And sometimes there are directives when we adopt legislation on the field of uh, criminal law, fighting against a number of serious criminal offenses which are of transnational nature, cross-border serious crime. That is the case of civil crime, that is the case of child pornography, that is the case of human trafficking. All of these issues have been dealt with by the European Parliament for the past few years under my experience as chair of the of the of the Libya Committee. And uh, it makes sense that I insist that uh, the European Union is in a serious crisis because the, the spread of mistrust is hindering these goals to be achieved to its best, to its very best. So we are way uh, behind our own scale of uh, commitments and goals as they were set when the so-called Stockholm program to unfold and develop the potential of the area of liberty, justice, and security was adopted back in December 2009, an incident with the entry into force of the treaty. But some steps have been made. So I understand. Correct me if I'm wrong, or I have misunderstood, or didn't get it right. That you would like to discuss with me this afternoon, precisely the subject of prostitution, <coughs> human trafficking, pornography. Is that correct? Well, let me tell you. These are issues extremely, extremely sensitive. So you know, the junction, crossroads of a number of perspectives. There is culture, there is inequality, there is power, and there are institutions 
involving trying to reach out to a number of issues and goals which are to be met. Well, these issues have been subject to, to arguments a number of times within the European Parliament to come up to the uh, actual evidence that we are here moving ourselves in a very gray area. Well, the fact is that the uh, actual knowledge of the subject matters which are involved <coughs> is not accurate at all. There is a lack of data, reliable data, in order to, to deal with, this, with these issues. That's, of course, the case of prostitution, first, for one thing. Big business, no doubt. Most billions, no doubt. 200 billion estimated around the world per year, no doubt. Millions of women involved in, in prostitution under the assumption that uh, heavy prostitution is, a, is an activity which lies on the on the fact that most cases would get women selling sex and men buying sex. This is not always the case, of course, but mostly, and heavily, it's an assumption. And prostitution is about women. Of course, mostly it's women selling sex and men buying sex. The, uh, the fact of the matter is that this is free business in the European Union, of course, and it's heavily related, tightly related, with human trafficking for a number of years now. That is also a fact. That is also a fact. Most of women involved or trapped into the prostitution business have been trafficked. That is a fact. So that is a field for criminal lawmaking for the European Union? Surely it is. But for the time being, what we have done in the European Union is first of all legislate on human trafficking. According to a so-called Palermo Protocol, which was adopted in 2000, provided an agreed and conventional definition of trafficking of human beings and initiated a number of further activities in relation with some other fields of action, like this one of the European, the Council of Europe, the European Convention on Human Rights and the Activities of the Council of Europe, who came to the Europe Convention Against Trafficking of Human Beings in 2003 and the directive against the traffic of human beings, human trafficking, which was finally adopted in 2011. The directive is 2011-36. That was adopted throughout my, 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 my delivery as, as, as chair of the Libre Committee. And uh, I would also mention the importance of Directive 2012 slash 29 concerning the standards and rights to support and protect the victims of crime. Both directives that I just mentioned were meant to replace relevant framework decisions which were effective up until the very moment in which these directives were adopted. There is a piece of legislation on the matter. And there have been a number of arguments about how to tackle the issue of prostitution. Let me tell you. In the European Union, even now after the Brexit, and until the moment in which the United Kingdom, the British government, decides to unleash 
the potential of Article 50 of the Treaty of the European Union. We are 28 member states. <coughs> we know that certain activities related to constitutional criminal offenses, that's for sure. But the actual legal dispensation concerning the, the prostitution related phenomena are very heterogeneous. You could argue that generally speaking, you could try to set the difference between two different models of approaching prostitution. One that you could largely refer to the regulatory model, which is the one who, which uh, stems or builds on the assumption that uh, it is impossible to eradicate completely prostitution, that declining as it might seem, there is always a certain presence within the prostitution business of women who have not been trafficked and claim for a certain status as providers of sex services which are asking for legal regulation when it comes to social protection, social security, healthcare assistance, tax paying, that is the regulatory approach. You might say that uh, the uh, paradigm of this approach is often depicted in the uh, Netherlands case. In the Netherlands case, where they have a huge sex industry, a huge sex market, which elaborates on the idea that there are many women which are simply making flexible money out of this activity and it should not be tackled only under the criminal law approach but there is also the what we could largely refer to abolitionist approach countries which are building on the negative uh, assessment of everything related to <coughs> and have a come at a certain point of time, to tackle heavily this issue under the criminal law point of view, trying to criminalize not only sex services, but also sex buyers, the customers of sexual business. You would say that the, uh, the paradigm of this approach would be suited. I was Minister of Justice of Spain when the Swedish Minister of Justice came, 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 came up with the idea of, uh, of uh, criminalizing and thus punishing sex consumers. And uh, I, I remember very, very vividly how, how I was part of that discussion in an informal Council of Ministers of Justice and Home Affairs when I was Minister of Justice. Many were Puzzled around the table, and uh, of course I, I try to complete my picture to come with all the data available in order to assess the possibility of criminalizing all sex consumers. And I was told by specialists, public prosecution, police services, that in Spain that would simply be the hand amount mean criminalizing. Hundred thousands every year, hundred thousands. Because the estimation is that in Spain, at least, at least two million sex consumes, consumptions take place on a daily basis. Paid sex, considering that there are roughly, roughly around 400,000 women involved in prostitution activities in Spain, five services a day, 
roughly between one million and two million. No easy task for a law enforcement agency to secure that all of those consumers could be effectively criminalized. But it is a discussion. And the Swedish experience has expanded in Scandinavia. Norway has endorsed the same approach. Finland has endorsed the same approach. And there is a serious discussion in Spain in order to exactly follow that rule within the Socialist Party. That is the approach. That is the approach. Which is, which is, which is a very, a very, uh, how do I put it? A radical approach to the evidence that increasingly so prostitution and human trafficking are related, narrowly related, and most women have been trafficked into prostitution illegally all the way from the starting point out right to the outset to the uh, to the to the uh, to the everyday uh, experience of, of, of that exploitation. So there is an argument right now taking place. And I would I would simply add that in in my experience and in my perception, the abolitionist approach is now uh, the upper hand within the European Parliament. It's the, uh, the abolitionist approach, it's criminalizing the whole thing upon the evidence that prostitution is increasingly related with exploitation of women being trafficked all the way, is the upper hand within the European Parliament's debate. But we have not come across a general criminal law approach at the European level to crack down on prostitution as a, as a purely experience of human trafficking. That is not the case by now. Of course it is the case when it comes to uh, child pornography and sexual exploitation <coughs> of the children. Of course, there is no doubt about that. We are talking about here adults which could argue about the relevance of consent. We're talking about minors, which per definition have to be protected against every possible way or experience of sexual abuse or exploitation. In this field of action, there are two important pieces of legislation. One is the so-called Lanzarote Convention of the Council of Europe. It wasn't Lanzarote because of me. <laughs> the Lanzarote Co Convention is called the Lanzarote Convention exactly because of me. Because I called the uh, Council of Ministers of the Council of Europe while being Minister of Justice. The Canary Islands happened to be my birthplace and my home. So I convened the Council of Ministers <coughs> of uh, Justice of the Council of Europe back in 2007, where we signed the Lanzarote Convention against sexual abuse and uh, sexual exploitation of children and child pornography of the Council of Europe. But we have done the same related very narrowly to this piece of legislation of the Council of Europe in the European Parliament by adopting the Directive 2012-90. 2011, 93 uh, of uh, of the uh, directive of the uh, of the European Parliament and the Council as co-legislators on combating the sexual abuse and sexual exploitation of children and child pornography, which is replacing the Council framework decision that was adopted back in 2004. This completes the picture of, 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 of the European Union standpoint when it comes to protecting children. And that means a variety of commitments, specifying the standards, the criminal standards when it comes to abetting or inciting sexual abuse to victims of minors, when it comes to recruiting children for the purposes or means of sexual exploitation. Of course, 
uh, induced, inside direct sexual exploitation of minors, and protecting the victims, the children, the children, the children's rights, the children against any form of sexual exploitation. That is a, that is a, that is a point of consensus in the European Union. The argument still goes as to the rest of the pornography industry. It is blurring as a landscape. I'm sure you know that the industry of pornography is huge. It's a global business. And uh, when it involves adults who consent, supposedly, the legislation of legal is industrial, intellectual property, labor rights, not criminal law. But when it injures the indemnity of minors who are to be protected, women underage or men underage, then that is a serious criminal matter, also under the European law standards. Final point. And then we, we open the discussion. Progress has, has, has been made, and uh, we, we got to reckon with the fact that uh, there has been a, a, a push forward uh, lawmaking in sensitive areas, as I have referred to for the past few minutes, within the realm of the area of space, we call it liberty, justice, and security. It is Title V of the Treaty of Function of the European Union, Articles 67 to 89 of the Treaty of Function of the European Union. Progress has been made. But we are losing momentum. Because of this terrible crisis, and because of the terrible crisis management, which is a different thing, this trust, this allegiance, are inciting more and more member states to simply disengage from the goals that were set, even from the law which is already at site, which is already in place, in a number of also very sensitive issues. Member states are disregarding the legislation we have adopted in the European Parliament on the so-called asylum package, on the so-called Schengen package, on the so-called big things protection. I mean, criminal law, there are a number of pieces of legislation under uh, the rapporteur for the European criminal law. I have to be the rapporteur of protection the financial interests by means of criminal law, which is of the essence in order to set up <coughs> finally the foreseen European public prosecutor's office. But member states are disengaging from the whole thing, they are watering it down, and the ambitions that were proclaimed in the Lisbon Treaty are waning, declining. And the threat is that they, sooner than later, will be smashed to smithereens. And it's a, it's a serious concern for many of us. We would like to make big progress and big difference in this field of European criminal law. For that, it is, it, it, it is a good thing that we keep the open dialogue with all of the institutions and organizations stemming from the civil society, women's rights associations, intellectuals, academia, specialists on the field, which are a substantial contribution to the clarification of the uh, situation as it is, so that we can really deliver as lawmakers in the European Parliament the processes is uh, now open, but I insist the prospects, the perspectives are darker than ever before, more obscure and uh, worrisome. The region is pretty scary for the ambitions that were proclaimed in the recent treaty. So I didn't want to spare this uh, criticism of mine, which makes me a combatant a fighter in this uh, uh, landscape of uh, uh, European uh, 
severe deterioration that I refer to when I when I published that essay Europe in a suicidal mood. <laughs> so yeah. now I'll, I'll, your disposal ready to to accept <laughs> Thank you so much for your exposition on, on the position of the European Union uh, in these issues. I would like to know, you've said the European Union is considering an abolitionist approach to the problem, though it hasn't uh, approved yet that point of view. My question is, we all uh, mostly agree that an abolitionist point of view would reduce the possibilities of uh, regulating the issue and so the possibilities of knowing how long and how far could that issue really went. So how can we, how are we supposed to try to end with the issue if we do not really know the we point it goes? Thank you. Thank you. How, how do you operate? Should I, let's say, hear some round of questionings, let's say three or four, and then try to make a comprehensive second round from me to you and then back words and then again would that be suitable to you would you agree with that three or four okay three or four okay thank you uh, i am dalibor I, I come from croatia so i cannot pronounce your name <laughs> uh, my name is juan is juan. that difficult can i call him mr juan <laughs> <laughs> so uh this is what it, Wrote this way. Uh, in my personal humble opinion, this approach you were mentioning, abolition. Uh, I do not think that this is how we solve uh, uh, solve this policy in within the EU. Uh, I would compare it to import and export with, with abolishment in Sweden. Uh, they just exported the problems in Prague and Krakow, for example. Uh, that way, the less fortunate countries have to cope both with domestic people and both with tourists from Sweden. I have seen a great number of planes coming to Prague and Krakow, uh, especially from Sweden, to enjoy nightlife in between everything else. So, uh, I would like you to, to comment is it even possible to make it? Uh, a common European policy that way. Um, so, um, my name is Isabella, I'm doing a Master in International Relations, and um, I would like to first of all congratulate you to your achievements um, according to the child pornography and the sexual abuse in the Lanzarote Convention. Um, I would like to also um, add to my um, fellow um, um, members here that I agree that an abolishment would not really um, be an, uh, an abolishment appro an abolitionist approach would not really be um, beneficial um, because I would believe that um, prostitution would be pushed toward uh, let's say a black market approach and I, I do not know how what effect that would have. So I have two questions for you. First of all, um, what did you think that um, um, an abolitionist approach would rather increase criminalization of prostitution, leading um, prostitutes to um, do that <coughs> off, um, offshore approach of, of sexual services? And the second question is for, towards the European Union. Robert. It would be, um, wouldn't you, um, I would like to know, whether you think, um, where does this negativity come from? I mean, we know there was a financial crisis, but wouldn't you think that all of these kind of uh, shaming ping pong that we th see through the information era, you can see it from the page of the Bundestag towards the comments on from Merkel in the immigration policy. We can see it in so many things, you know, in the, in the election process between Trump and Clinton. There's so much negativity going on. So I would like to know, um, how do you actually, um, what do you do to stop that, to have 
the European values of you know human dignity, of the respect, of um, a kind of common approach of um, mutual values, and kind of more a peaceful approach because I see a lot of negativity. Thank you very much. Fourth, fourth, and then I go. Then I go again. I, I give you back the floor after our first round. Hi, my name is Sam. I'm from the UK, so my thoughts only count until we leave the EU, of course. <laughs> I didn't vote to leave, by the way, I voted to remain. Uh, one of the main issues I always have uh, with EU and also within the National Parliament of the UK conversations about sex work, there has been a very limited approach to actually inviting sex workers to offer their own opinions, sex workers who chose to be within the profession. Uh, I work with the Green Party of England and Wales. We, we are actually the, the only group uh, in the UK Parliament to actually have solid policy on this. So my question to you would be, uh, to what extent have sex workers been involved in discussions and processes in Parliament? And by sex workers, I mean those who have chosen to be part of that profession. Now we're talking very interesting round of questions. But first, let me just share the impression that it's pretty obvious here by now that there are different points of view here, live, <laughs> right here. I mean, some some of you have made a, a standpoint on abolitionism. Some of you have objected. Is it feasible? Is it realistic? Is it counterproductive? Will it criminalize a whole variety of situations in which some social approach would be suitable or more satisfactory in its delivery than simply criminalizing? Well, the discussion is there. But let me tell you, there is evidence now, once the uh, Swedish experience got started, I was there, I remember, I tell, I tell you, I was, I was there when, 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 the, when the Swedish minister came up with the idea and uh, shared it and uh, not only invited, asked the rest of us to try to set in motion some kind of a national survey about the actual situation of the prostitution markets within our domestic dispensations, just to come up with the evidence in response that the situation is extremely heterogeneous in Europe. Now we know that there are some countries in which the prostitution business is larger and more significant than others. Spain, sadly enough, is a number one prostitution consuming country. A number one, not only in Europe, around the world. Spain, Spain, Spain is top of the, of the hill. For a number of reasons, we could argue, I mean, can we make a topological <coughs> interpretation? Can we make a sociological interpretation? Can we talk about a combination of elements? The fact is that, yes, in Spain, the uh, prostitution consuming business is particularly significant. It's massive. It's massive. When I put in motion my own national survey as Minister of Justice, I, I, for the first time ever, I came to know things that I didn't know about. That in Spain, for instance, is perfectly, perfectly uh, 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 feasible that young men, which are living satisfactory lives in every possible way at your imagination, do resort to prostitution for a certain number of motivations and circumstances, young men with girlfriends do this sort of prostitution, which discards the prejudice that only the total failure of a grown-up man whose life has turned out to be a total mess of disaster resorts to prostitution because he's got no other choice. No, that's not the fact. That's not the truth. That's not the truth. Can the law enforcement agencies, can the Spanish public prostitution, for instance, secure that every man in Spain who resorts to prostitution can be criminalized, can be put to bench? Can we make every man in Spain on a daily basis stand 
in a criminal trial? Not easy, not an easy task. So yes, abolitionism faces a challenge, a factual challenge, a practical challenge, not only philosophical, not only philosophical. But there is also evidence, I would like to share with you this, this, this knowledge, that according to the principle of legal theory, <coughs> excuse me, economic theory, of economic science, we call it in Spain, of economic theory, every demand, you remember that principle? Every supply stimulates its own demand. Every supply generates its own demand. So when you simply, when you simply uh, uh, lift every barrier, every deterrence on the sex consumption that uses prostitution, the demand skyrockets. Skyrockets. That is also a fact. That is also a fact. When consuming sex, it's the most natural thing to do when you're young, when you're having fun, when you're drinking beer or whatever else, and nothing happens because it's perfectly legal, then the demand simply skyrockets. We have also seen that. That is the case in the Netherlands. That is the case in Germany, which is also in the line of regulatory approach. Regulatory approach. So there is a challenge which underlies this discussion, which is still in motion. It is taking place. Undergoing all these arguments, there is a there is a task that has to be fulfilled. And that is to tell the situations in which there is consent and a voluntary approach to the prostitution activity out of free will, which is a tiny minority of the women, of the total amount of women which are exposed to that activity, a tiny minority, but yet existent, yet still there, and of course, crack down on human trafficking which is largely the case of women involved in prostitution activities and trapped into the prostitution chain. Right now in Spain, most women delivering sexual services are from foreign origin. Nigeria, by thousands. Hundred thousand. Asian, Latin Americans, but also women coming from the so-called Pecos the newcomers of the European Union, the rich member states, Indians, Barriers, Indians, Laws, Sex. That is a fact. So sexual exploitation has to be cracked down. Sexual exploitation has to be tackled as a massive criminal phenomenon. And it has the, 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 the criminal response has to make it all the way. In origin, where does it get started? In the process and in the exploitation, in the prostitution, in the brothels, in the brothels, the men who usually collect the profits of the sexual trafficking of the daily basis. That is a criminal phenomenon that has to be tackled. Not easy. The discussion, I insist, the argument is, is, is in place, but I tell you, yes, I've got the impression having chaired a number of hearings on the matter, having tested this, the, the, the feelings of the political groups on these issues, I would say that the abolitionist approach is now in the upper hand. So it means that a negative regard to every prostitution activity is, is, is largely the authoritarian approach in the, in, the, in the European Parliament, which does not mean the end of the story, of course. Because I'm sure you know that we are calling this session the Council. Council. So my second remark is, you may be right when you had this frustrating experience of getting involved in the discussion of a directive and stumbling with the Council, which is effectively the missing link of the European decision making by now, actually is the wrong link. Actually, it's what we call metaphorically the stigma 
in the European architecture right now. The council is simply <coughs> engaging from the lawmaking process. And I say out of outrage, personal outrage. I tell, I, I, I tell you, I told you before, I am the rapporteur of the European criminal law. I am the rapporteur of the so-called big fire, protection of financial interests of the European Union by means of criminal law. What happened? It's European criminal law in the nation. Article 83 is a legal basis. Article 83 of the Treaty of Fortune of the European Union. The key devices and authorizes the European Parliament to, 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 to have a say when it comes to uh, uh, evolving the, and, and, and unfolding the potential of the European Parliament as a criminal lawmaker. But we stumbled with the Council time and time again. And every rotating presidency simply accommodates itself in the inertia that, you know, the council has not made up its mind yet. We are not making any progress. There is not consensus enough. There is not sufficient majority. There are a number of countries which object. And there are a number of military files which are blocked, blocked by now. Because the, the council is not willing to incorporate the goals and the commitments that were enshrined in the Lisbon Treaty. Although every member state, including those who are now most reluctant, like Hungary and Poland, signed the Lisbon Treaty when it entered into force. They signed it. It wasn't those many years ago. It was yesterday afternoon. To put it so, it was the other day. Some years ago, they signed it, and now they are betraying the goals that were set. So they are not making any progress when it comes to uh, 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 legislating on, on, on the criminal law. Which means that setting the goal of standardizing a European approach to a certain prostitution which is to be criminalized is now a goal beyond reach. I don't see that easily happening in the foreseeable future. In a time in which Poland and Hungary are growing uh, upwards, to put it mildly, in a time when the visitor group is objecting the whole thing, in a time in which the UK is uh, is uh, facing out in, in, in a time in which there is such display of mutual distrust and lack of political will to cooperate and integrate and incorporate the goals that were enshrined in the Lisbon Treaty. I don't see that is a foreseeable goal that we standardize a truly criminal law approach on, on the worst dimensions of prostitution. And uh, 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 having said this, uh, to, to, to answer the, the specific questions that were put into the, into, into, into the last chart, negativism, yes, uh, uh, I pay tribute to the importance of these issues we are discussing here this afternoon. I really make them mine. But sadly enough, they are uh, they are losing momentum and importance within the European process. The uh, the main leaders and representatives of the European institutions, if they deserve that name, are so much concentrated on the uh, on the uh, European semester on uh, cracking down on countries in difficulties and uh, imposing fines and penalties to countries in dire straits, including money and Spain, that uh, negativism is on the rise. It is on the rise. And the feasibility of uh, coming together and setting common relevant approach, legal approach to this kind of sensitive issues is further and further ahead. 
further up on the road, I don't know if we will manage to be back to what we were once, or we simply accept that there shall not be a future of reliable aerial pollution is just insecure no more. Negative distance is, is actually in the rise. Actually in the rise. Shall we give the second round? Sure. If you please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andres. Uh, just a quick, a quick question. You said that member states, the member states often disregard uh, the legislation coming from the European Parliament. So, what's in your opinion the way forward uh, from the own European Parliament to to change that kind of behavior? Okay. Uh, thank you for your answers. Uh, we have another one, please. So, uh, we, I believe that if uh, the member states are not committed with a strong Europe, none of these measures, as you said, can be passed. So, what do you think the future of the Europe is? Generalizing a little bit the question. And uh, as I'm Spanish, focusing on Spain, do you think this is going to end? And when? Like the actual situation of the country. Thank you. The actual situation of the country. What do you mean? Stalemate, <laughs> 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 political stalemate, or no stalemate, blockade, something like it. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, since you said that uh, in the European Union. There is the unconditional approach um, towards prostitution. <coughs> Has the union uh, thought um, of putting the line what um, belongs, what is considered prostitution, and what isn't? So um, forms like uh, escort services, or I don't know, swinger clubs, or online. Um, I, I, I don't know how to call this form. Um, <laughs> Uh, sugar daddies. Um. <laughs> sugar daddies. Yes, yes. What? What is it? Would you explain? <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Again. Fourth. Fourth. Yeah. Fourth. fourth. There's no one else because that would be the last one. So anybody else? No. So um, one last question. So I, I wanted to ask if you take the abolitionist approach, like for example, obviously. In Turkey, it would be never thinkable to have a prostitution legalized. But if you take this set as an example, you have extremely high, viol high rates of violence against women. Yes. You have men that put up um, a lot of frustration, um, both physical and mental. There is a lot of, um, like, there are really high uh, levels of raping. So uh, having an abolition, I mean, um, obviously, maybe there are men that have physical frustrations. And they do, or they work um, the whole week, so they do not have time. Let's say, but I think that uh, I trust, I believe that having an abolitionist approach will increase violence against women, and um, especially those um, against the weakest. So um, I mean, obviously, I'm not um, happy about like prostitution in general. I wouldn't want my boyfriend to go to a prostitute, but um, still, I think that for society to have a healthy society, I think um, there must be some sort of solution. I mean, you cannot just invest in education. It's there's so then this physical um, issue, which could lead to violence against women furthermore. Thank you. Of course, this is, this is simply fascinating. I'm sure you all experiences all the nuances of this troublemaking situation, which blurs the difference, the line that has been told between what is exactly prostitution about and how do we make a difference with all these services that are provided by women escorting men or men escorting women for the exchange of some kind of a salary which is a legal action of course it is for uh, uh, companies which provide uh, occasional uh, escort for 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 people which are in need of being accompanied <coughs> to a certain social occasion 
Of course, there's, there's, a, there's a, a whole history of mankind involved here. Whenever we argue about constitution as a subject, there is a history of mankind. How many times have you heard that old uh, refrain which allegedly claims that constitution is the oldest thing in the world? It is as old as mankind, that it has always existed, it will always exist. Because there will always be people in need willing to pay, and there will always be people willing to be paid in order to exchange some, 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 some kind of sexual intercourse or whatever it is, of whatever kind. Are gays as prostitutes? Are, are uh, stewardess in a certain social environment? Playing the prostitution game? Are sports playing the prostitution game? This is, this is a philosophical issue. Well, a line must be told very clearly when we know that someone has been trapped at a certain point of time of their lifetime against their free will, against her free will or his free will, her free will mostly, to that kind of a sexual trafficking. And has, 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 is subject to actual exploitation so that there is no choice, there is no alternative. When there is a valid alternative, then let's face it, it's a different uh, playing field. I have seen prostitutes, prostitutes marching in Paris, prostitutes marching in Paris, claiming for their dignity and saying, Who are you? You tell me that I cannot allow myself a standard of living by exerting this activity, which should be legal, should be protected, should be recognized with social rights, with social security, with health protection. They have a say, they have a legal claim, they have a standpoint. Those women, which are, according to their own experience, exerting that kind of an activity out of their free will, but let's face it too, that it's not the majority of cases in the current standpoint of the, the, the constitution landscape in and across Europe. That is not the usual situation. That is not the average. There's many and many and many increasingly more women that have been trafficked. That is the issue, I insist. That is the issue. Yes, the abolitionist approach uh, has a B side. Of course, it depicts all of that range and variety of situations in the black market. In the black market. Just as it happens, just as it happens with the consumption of drugs or some kind of uh, forbidden substances. When you forbid all substances, be it for pleasure, be it out of uh, the delivery of sports activity. You have to face new problems, you face new challenges. If you forbid everything, someone will come up with another technique, with some other chemistry, with some other idea to invent something to increase your potential, escaping or eluding the, for, the, 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 the forbidden substances. The same goes with sex. If you forbid this, then there will be a big side, it is some kind of a beyond the curtain black market activity or way to put it. But it makes sense the abolitionist approach in which what you're trying to do is to wipe off the outright most outrageous dimension of sex trafficking and sex labor. For instance, buying the services of a person, women mostly, right on the street, Ride in your car, come along, hop along, blow job. It happens on a daily basis in every capital town in Europe. It happens in Madrid every day. It happens in the Casa de Campo every day. So it makes sense to try to wipe off that cruelest, darkest dimension of sexual trafficking and say, hey, that is forbidden. If you go to a certain place where you have certain conditions, 
certain environment which is out of the sight of the general public, there is little the law enforcement agencies can do to prevent that from happening 100%. But at least to buy sex while riding your car, hop along, have sex with me right away, five minutes and then leave. Uh, that, 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 that is something that should be cracked down. That is something that should be tackled under the criminal point of view. Yes, everything I see is, is subject to argument. But we, 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 should, we should try to identify the most <coughs> serious dimensions of the criminal projection of the sexual trafficking, which I insist, according <coughs> to experience, is now heavily related to sexual and human trafficking. Human trafficking. Human trafficking of women for the purposes of getting them trapped into the, into the sexual activity. Having said this, there have been a number of, of new questions being raised according to the European process, which is deteriorating, of course, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the question of violence, and finally the question of Spain, if you allow me. Well, violence first. Uh, violence is a criminal offense always. It has to be. Prostitution always involves violence. But in many occasions it does. Violence has, has to be tackled under the criminal law perspective. Exerting violence upon women, that is a criminal offense by every possible way. So when there is evidence for the laws or enforcement agency that we're not simply watching some sex trafficking in place, but also Violence, except for the women, threatening, coercion, or imposing the sex slavery machine or sex slavery machinery upon the free will and free choice women, then we've got a criminal case. Then we, no doubt, beyond any doubt, we've got a criminal case. You, you may argue that all forms of sexual exploitation involve some kind of some grade of violence. You may argue that. You may argue that. We're talking about the, 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 the violence which is irrelevant to the law enforcement agencies which deal with crime and the fight against the, the fight against crime. That is that is an issue which is not related. And of course, let me assure you in that in that particular regard we have legislated in the in the in the, in the European Union. Of course violence is is a, is a is a chapter in the directive on the protections of victims, protecting victims of criminal offenses. Uh, we set forth a specific array of uh, dispositions to protect women from violence. The same goes with children, of course. Children are not subject to any form of violence. That is a criminal offense, hundred percent. And the same goes with the, with the human trafficking, when there is violence involved. And the, then the European Union process were, uh, I, uh, I mean, this time we are being specific. We are focusing on an issue, which is this dimension of the uh, criminal law making, dealing with prostitution and with sexual exploitation. And uh, thus extending the scope of human trafficking and pornography or child pornography, particularly. But I have, uh, as you may assume, I have devoted much energy for the past six years that I have been in the European Parliament to this huge overall crisis in which the European Union is losing its face. Losing its identity, reason for being in the European Union. I have, I have a, I have a challenged this situation in every possible way, uh, and that is the case of many in the European Parliament. And the European Parliament is not the only institution. I might argue that uh, for the past six years, seldom has been the case of good news coming from the European Union. Sometimes it's been the case from the European Parliament. We have legislated on data protection, 
we have rejected international agreements that were prejudicial or detrimental to fundamental rights, namely the privacy of the European citizens. We have done that on two occasions with treaties that were negotiated with the United States on the grounds of fundamental rights that we use from the European Union. We have legislated also <coughs> on uh, issues involving consumer rights hand in hand with the European Court of Justice, which is also a source of good news. As for the rest of the Commission or the Council, we have not we have not good news and we have not good news for a number of years now. Yes, the European Union is a huge crisis. And the European Parliament uh, is a pluralistic house, that's for sure. It's not a unanimity you know, body. There are different political positions, even within every political group, even within my group, socialist group. There are different positions there. I mean, the, 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 uh, the approach of the Italian Democrats, for instance, to uh, to uh, women's rights, same-sex couples, it's not alive, the approach of the Spanish socialists, for one thing, just an example. Just an example. Our Polish colleagues do not want the rest of us to argue about abortion, because this, they think it's counterproductive in the national debate. Some of us do claim for a debate on abortion on a European level. So yes, there is a variety of situations, but largely the European Parliament still lays on the assumption that the European Union must be bailed out and still worthy to be European. It is decreasingly so the position of the Council. In the Council there is a spread of uh, bad feelings uh, against each other, mistrust, uh, negative competition, not cooperation anymore. And there are factional groups, the Visigarh groups, the Southerners, different forms of rebellion against German hegemony, provided the fact that Germany has been called a reluctant hegemon for some number of years now. So the situation, I insist, this is, is uh, worrisome, more than ever before. But there is no way we can understand the troubles that we have been enduring in the member states, within the member states, even in the national politics we all, if we do not put them under the light of the European coordinate, which has been a catastrophe, which has been a catastrophe for almost 10 years now, for eight years in a row, that is the case of Spain. There is not a chance to understand how a Spanish politics have been uh, subject to a path of change, dramatic in so many ways, if we do not put the Spanish situation beyond, no, excuse me, below the light of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the European state of affairs. The European state of affairs is the efficient explanation to all the sufferings and pains that we've been going through for, for the past eight years. Rising inequality, <coughs> goals that have been set and are impossible to meet, deficit reduction, and uh, debt reduction included, the budgetary constraints, the political strains, the redefinition of the political landscape, it's all related to this huge European crisis, and it has affected the Spanish state of mind. Once upon a time, Spain was an example, an outstanding example, on the European scale of a new <coughs> enthusiastic political community, new enthusiastic society. Not anymore, particularly among the youngers. The youngers are also disengaging from the European ideas. When I was 20, I was 
truly European because I had no other choice. Being European was a combination, the ultimate combination of a number of desirable things, not anymore. The idea of Europe has slowly waned among the youngers. It's also, uh, it's also deteriorated severely, so eroded, very much eroded. Because the cohesion policy is flowing, solidarity is, is not of the matter anymore. On the contrary, the subversions of those principles operates in a way in which countries in difficult and dire straits are getting punished for the sake of not meeting their goals. So the situation is, 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 is terrible, but always have in mind below the, uh, the uh, effective and, uh, determination, effective influence and determination of this European landscape, which is, which is uh, so much eroded and, and deteriorated. And as for your point, I, I guess I gave you some idea, some idea, that there are a number of situations, yes, which are blurry. And I insist that we all should assume that criminalizing every form of uh, what we might call mistress, company, escorts, uh, societal variations of uh, women being paid for being with men, making it a purely criminal law issue would be beyond reach for the law enforcement agencies, not only in Spain, in every country. And of course, it would create difficulties in order to incorporate the varied forms of association with third countries, as is the case of Turkey, as is the case of Turkey. I don't think Turkey is ever going to make it as a member state of the European Union. I think the whole thing has been called off. Ten years ago, there was this kind of uh, Kind of a, a funny state of mind in which they thought that everyone would go European, just naturally so. Now we are coming to terms with facts and reality. The variation, the heterogeneity of uh, institutional landscapes and architectures of the member states which are already in have set forth the so called Copenhagen dilemma. I'm sure you have known what the Copenhagen dilemma is about by now. They call the Copenhagen criteria, those criteria which were set back in a council that took place under a Danish presidency back in 1993, in which every member state which is filing its candidacy, its application for entering the European Union has to comply with the Copenhagen criteria, rule of law, separation of powers, fundamental rights, representative democracy, political pluralism, media pluralism, and a readability to incorporate the rules of the single market. The dilemma of Copenhagen, the Copenhagen dilemma, says it now that we need urgently a way to Examine and subject to scrutiny those member states which are already in the club, which are already in the club, not those which are applying for a new membership, those which are already in the club, whether they continually uh, comply with these principles. Because it is unacceptable that once you're in the club, you simply dismantle media pluralism, as is the case in Hungary, you simply dismantle separation of powers. You simply dismantle the uh, the uh, constitutional supremacy or the role of the constitutional court, as is the case in Poland. If you allow me, it's the case in Poland that the constitutional court has been challenged and dismantled by the ruling party in government. So there are a number of issues which are now uh, uh, new emergency breaks for the for the European debate. But I insist that there is no way we can truly understand the situation of a, 
particular country as is debated today means stalemate with redefinition of political landscape if we do not insert the specific case of Spain within the overall frame of this huge European crisis? Well, um, if we, I guess we are running out of course now. Uh, I would really um, like to thank you for your words, for the insight on the, on the situation and for the your point of view on the fact as auditor of the committee leader with this matter. Um, I'm sure we have plenty of questions still to pose on him. And maybe we can do it on the cocktail, but still we are running out of time and we need to get out of here. Is there a doctor? Yeah, is there a doctor? <laughs> am, I, am I missing something? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now for the closing ceremony or the final state of the closing ceremony, I would like to call on um, Miguel Angel. Sorry, um, Miguel Angel Munoz Martinez, who is a uh, subdirector of the general direction for European Affairs and cooperation with the state to come to the stage and thank you. Welcome, Freddie. Welcome here to our final stage, and maybe you can bring all your insight on the topic we have been discussing for. Another one and a half now. <laughs> okay, so Sorry, yes. thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. It has been very interesting. The, I'm not here from, uh, from the morning, and I have been here for one hour or something like that. It has been, it has been very interesting. I think that I have, I, I can say, not being more interesting than Mr. Lopez Aguilar, he knows a lot about these kind of topics. So I'm going to refer uh, more general <coughs> to, to the, the different uh, challenges I think that the European Union has uh, today, has today. This year we, we have, uh, we are celebrating that Spain is part of the European Union from 30 years ago. And the world has changed, has changed a lot. So I think it's a good moment to 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 review what what we can, what we have done, but especially what we should do this time now. So I'm going to refer not for long some challenges of the European Union. First, I think it's explaining the European Union. How many people do you think know what's the Europe Europe, Europe 2020? Or Horizon 2020, or something like that. Not more than 10%. The European Union is used to speak about very complicated things, very specific names, <coughs> as if it was very important. And of course, it's important, but I think that we have to, to speak about what, what is important for people. And what is important for people is that we, we have no borders in Europe still have no borders i'm not i'm not sure if we will be able to maintain it that we can study or work in another country that we have a european health insurance card so there are a lot of things we have done to europe we have done a lot of things together but i think that we are 
forgetting what we are doing together and we are speaking about big projects, big strategies that no one's no no one's interested in, in them. And of course we can't forget the main objective of the European Union in the beginning and it's still alive, the peace. <laughs> we are living in peace in, inside the European Union in the longest period of peace in history. It's not easy. I'm sure that in Croatia, they know that it's not easy. And now they are in the European Union. So I think it's the first point. The second point, of course, Brexit. It's a, a door we have opened, or British people have, have, have opened. We don't know what is beyond the door. What is uh, sure is that uh, uncertainty, it's ne uncertainty next is not good for anything. It's bad. And that's, we are, if we are together, I think it's better. What will be the, the result? We are not sure. I think that they are not sure. In fact, they are not asking to go now. So we don't know if they want to go or not. So it's, it's not good. Third, the euro. As you have been talking in the last minutes, the crisis, the big crisis, the huge crisis, the, I think that pro probably one of the biggest crises of the European Union from its beginning is not end. We have to continue working, but we have a problem, and I will talk about it uh, later, that we are not very fast, and the world is fast. So if we have a problem, an economic problem, probably in the States, you can answer in two weeks. Time to, to talk with Republicans and Democrats. And so that we, we need two years. It's not good. If we need two or three years to, 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 be, to, to reach an agreement to do something, it's not good. And then we have to do the correct thing. So first we have to act. And then we have to, 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 be, to be correct. If, if, we, if we don't make a mistake, in two years, we need four years to correct. So we, we need to reform something in the European institutions to be faster. I think. Fourth, mobility. Only 10% of people in Europe live in another country from their birth. And it's not too much. It's impossible to make work uh, the single market without people working in different countries. If we, if we have unemployment here, it's political that people have to go to another country. It's not a very big problem. It's what we have had all the history. 50 years ago, in Spain, people came from Galicia to Madrid, and it wasn't a drama. Now, people have to, to, to travel, to go, to work, anywhere they have to work. And if we want a single market, a single market is that is that the, the work factor can, can travel and can go to another country, so it's important. But we have the problem of language. A lot of people can't communicate in another language. And I think that we have to be positive. We have uh, we have the Erasmus program. People that has have participated in the Erasmus program has uh, forty percent of uh, superior uh, higher employability young people that have been, can participate. So it's a good point. So if we want to, to, to reach, to make the best of the European project, of the single market, we have to live in Europe, not in our country, not in our city only. Five refugees. It's not the problem of uh, one million people, but it's a lot of people. It's that we have a lot of problems around Europe, and if we don't help to solve that problems, those problems, we will have still more refugees. And one million people is difficult to manage. 10 million people is still more difficult. We are not being able to manage one million people. And it's not good for you. We are not being able to coordinate ourselves. It's not a good point for you. But the worst thing is that if we are not able to solve it today, we will have a deeper problem in two years, two years, and it's not sure that we will be able to, to, to manage it. So, sixth problem, security. 
internal security and, and terrorism and exterior security. Internal security, I think that all the countries are fighting terrorism. I'm not sure if the European Union has a very strong, I, I, in fact, I'm, I'm sure that it, it has not a strong policy, the defense security policy in the world. But I think that we have a problem that it's, I think it's before that problem, at least that uh, not all the countries know, not all the countries think the same thing, the same thing. So sometimes France can go <laughs> to, to help or to do something to country, then Germany do the opposite thing, Italy, I don't know, another thing, Spain, I don't know, uh, Hungary, another thing. What's the European Union position? I don't know. And we can't wait for the states always to solve the problems of the security in the Mediterranean. Seventh, energy. We can't have a single market without energy market. And we are energy dependent, very energy dependent, especially in some countries, among them Spain. We don't have single, an energy single market, we are not interconnected. And sometimes if, if, if in the north they have problems to, to, to get the energy, we can't help from the south, and we, vice versa. So, we, so it's, it's not good. We have telecommunications, we have the roads, we have the airports, but we need to interconnect the energy. And of course, we don't have a European model of energy. France think that uh, nuclear energy is the best. Germany don't use it, doesn't use it. The United Kingdom is building some nuclear uh, centrals. We are not doing that. I'm not sure, I'm, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not the person to decide what's the best thing. But what, for sure it's not the best thing is uh, to have a model. European model. So I think that we have to face it. And it's not easy. Eighth, the research and development. We are in a continuous and faster research and development revolution, technology revolution. The most important technology companies in the world are Americans. If we want to be in the first line of the development, we have to be in the first line of research and development. I think that European Union is, is doing a lot with the Horizon 2020 program, but probably it's not enough to do something about that uh, as, as, the, as, the, as the Horizon 2020. Probably we have to, to do more from the countries. Nine, the world is globalized. It's globalized, so to talk to 1,000 million people in China, more than 1,000. 1,500, or in India, or the 300 in the States, 200 in Brazil, we should be 500 million of Europeans, not the 47 million in Spain, or the 80 million in, in Germany. So we, if we don't learn to do it together, probably we, we will not say nothing because no one will, like, will, will want to, to, to listen to us. And of course, as I have told you before, I think that we have to be faster. Probably 50 years ago, our institutions were enough, and it has, they have been enough to develop a very good European project, because we have, in fact, a very good European project. But we have to, to change it to be able to be so fast as the world is. The world is very fast, and we need to be very fast. And then, as uh, Mr. Lopinagla has said before, I think that we are losing our identity, our well-being model. And I think that it's very easy to, to see. I have, brought, I have brought the United Nations each year from 2012 uh, collaborates with the World Happiness Report. So it's it's not the unique way to, uh, to say what, which is the, the best country or the most developed country, but probably it's more complete than the richest, the richest country. The GDP is not the only indicator. Okay. If we check it, we find that 11 of the, out of the first uh, 28 countries are from the European Union. It's not bad, but you think it's enough, 
uh, if we know about the our conditions, our welfare conditions, our GDP, our education, so we are doing something wrong. If we check it out, the whole Europe, not only the European Union, it's uh, 14 out of 28, so it's still better, but not very good. But we have another, another thing to, to, to reflect. Five out of five, the first five countries in, 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 this, in this ranking are European, the five first countries. Four out of 10 countries, the first four out of 10 countries are from the European Union and seven out of 10 are European. So we have two euros. <coughs> We have two euros, seven out of ten, but fourteen out of twenty-eight. We have two euros, so we have a problem. We don't have a unique problem, uh, a unique project. We have to change it because I think that the European Union is probably the best product we have developed in the twentieth century. I'm, I'm very euphoristic, uh, you're enthusiastic, but that's why I'm so criticizing. I criticize so much the European Union because I want to criticize to improve it. We have the best project and we have to take care of it. We have to take care of what a lot of people have done from the beginning of the European project. And I'm not sure if all of us, including, of course, our institutions, are doing everything. Walt Disney says that uh, think if you, what you are doing today get you closer to where you want to be tomorrow. I'm not sure if we are asking that question to, to your Union today, but it would be a, a good question. I think it's a good question for, for everyone. So I encourage you to, to continue debating like today, participating in things because Europe are people like you, active people that want to fight for Europe, that want to reach a better project and then want, that want to, 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 to be more happy. So, so thank you and for, for, for coming back. because yes it is our project it is our future and um, it is our European Union so I would like to on my behalf as president of the Commission and coordinator of this task thank you all for being here in this, during this week I hope you have enjoyed it as much as, as we have done it I hope you have learned as much as we have done um, not just about prostitution of trafficking but um, also about European policies with its strategic game. What happened when 1.5% of the population of the European Union does not pass a directive? Um, what happens if there is an informal debate, a faction meeting, and maybe a minister is not paying that, many, that much attention as it's as it, as it or he should be? But also, just to Bring, also, I would like to thank you for bringing this topic onto another dimension. When we were drafting our, this proposal, our, our purpose was to debate, and debate is what has, is what has been done here in this week. I truly uh, would like to think that you are coming back to your country with new reflections, to your country or to your homes, with new reflections on, on the topic. And I definitely would like to encourage you to join another MU, maybe ours next year, and to try to keep on moving as European citizens, because as Mr. Munoz said, it is our project, but our plan needs to be keep on work. So on my behalf, as Mrs. Juncker, <laughs> um, thank you all for being here and doing this week. Hope you have enjoyed it, have learned. 
and I wish you all the best in your call for tonight and next year. This is probably the last time that I attend as an international event as a Jeffrey. As some of you might know, just uh, uh, next, uh, actually next Saturday, I'm just um, resigning as president of Jeff Spain. So this is a special thing uh, for me to, um, you know, I wanted to have the fun at home. So that's why I, I just got some friends from here and there. And then just, okay, we're not making a model European Union. So um, I'm really glad that I could have um, this uh, last experience with you because it's been very enriching for me personally. And I also think that uh, it has also been for you. you know, one of the things that I, I think that has um, moved me uh, when I was um, involved in Jeff is uh, trying to, to, to reach all the people and try to, to let them feel the same passion that I feel uh, as pro-European. And I think it's not an easy task. And I think that's the, the, the most com compelling task that we have, all of us here, all of us that believe in, in a united Europe or in a federal Europe. Because um, I think that there are people out there that want to destroy the project that it took so long to, to build. There are many people there trying to uh, get out of you all the passion, all the feelings that you have, all the, the, the experiences that You've, uh, you've had positively about the union, and they can only you uh, feel this, this pain, these this black times where there is only despair, where, the, where it seems that the union is not advancing, it seems that the, the building is going to fall, it seems that everything is going wrong. But I know it's difficult to say in these times, but I think there is hope. And there is hope because there's always been a, a step forward every time that the European Union have had these bad times because it's always been people who have passion, who are passionate about the European Union, who have devoted their lives to do these things freely, on their own will, to, to, to get the best out of it, and, and, and to reach people and let them see that beyond uh, Germans, Hungarians, Polish, Spaniards or Italians, there is people. It's people with good will, people who want to do things together, people who want to uh, build a project together that can lead to a better uh, understanding. As uh, Mr. Munoz has said, peace has always been forgotten by the young people, but that was the, the, the main motto for the European Union. We've already achieved it. And we, we think that it's done, that the project is done, that there's nothing else to do. And that's really, really a problem if we think in that way. No, the project is to be built every day. And every day is built because of us. It's because there's someone there pushing on things to be done. Things are not going to happen alone. Things have happened because of people who are doing uh, an effort freely on their own uh, free time, just spending long hours uh, to make it possible. And I, I would also like to, to, to have this opportunity just to ask all the staff here with us also uh, later who have been working very hard. Just please stand all the people in the staff. And just make them because we have these people that have devoted uh, their time, their free time, not just for having fun, but also for, for, for letting you have the best conditions, the, the best we could, um, that we, we have had this. We have the chairs, we have all the staff members who have been working hard, we have Larry and all the team from, from Jeff Madrid who have been really, really pushing forward to do all the things that uh, had to be done in order to have a successful model. I really hope that you have enjoyed this. Certainly, we have, have had fun these days. We've laughed to get, lo together. We've danced together also. We've uh, even bleed together. In fact, uh, uh, I think that somebody had to explain me what happened in the council, how it, uh, it came that you started 14 and now you're only seven. I'm starting to worry there's a serial tear inside. <laughs> Because uh, at every time that I look at the, at the meeting, there's something else missing. So. 
I don't know what's going on there, but uh, you should care about <laughs> Just watch your back. Um, you know, we're uh, close to an end, and I hope that the model does not end here, because um, we we have a passion for this. I, I think we have shared debates, we have served, uh, certain many important things these days, but I think that this shouldn't be over. I do not forget that uh, uh, we still have a pending uh, paper to write together just to tell the European movement that, the European Parliament, sorry, that we've discussed about uh, prostitution, pornography, human trafficking, and we got to some conclusions. And we should make out of these four or five days worth it. You know, the European Commission, all of Europe is paying so that we can have this, this debate and we have to give it back. Because this is, everything is all about this. It's giving back with, with God so that we can, we can make a better Europe together. So I really hope that you got from, from these days you know, the best out of it. And you know that we can write this paper together so that we can transmit the passion that we have about Europe, that the project can still be alive because it's alive inside us. So only if we do this, then the European Union has a future because the future of Europe is inside you.